The first thing I want to talk about is that ThoughtWorks as an organization is held up by the three pillars of our mission. And those missions are to, those pillars are run a sustainable business, which means not in the eco sense, but in the sense that we have to earn money and keep the organization alive and, and going. That's different than maximizing profit. Champion software excellence and by all its definitions, so that's technology, process, you've heard people talking about. Uh, most of the day, how we, how we work on that. And the last one sometimes surprises people. This is our social mission, our social pillar, which is to advocate passionately for social and economic justice. And that's where my program comes in. So what do we do? We, with our technology skills, we serve organizations that serve the underserved, that serve the disempowered, and that serve the poor. And we do this by taking our skills and our offerings that we provide in the commercial space to these organizations that are serving the poor. That's innovation design, technology strategy, software implementation, operations and production support. And we do it sometimes paid, sometimes pro bono, and sometimes the individuals within ThoughtWorks volunteer their own time or the time that they have unassigned in between projects, which uh, in California, where I'm from, we call the beach. The more serious consultants here might call it the bench because you're punished and sitting on the bench. But in California, in between projects, we're on the beach. So who do we work with? We work with a variety of organizations, large and small. These are some of the organizations we're currently working with or have worked with. Uh, everything from massive UN agencies and international NGOs all the way down to small social innovators and social enterprises, the two people in a garage or the two people in a straw hut. I'm just going to mention very quickly, I won't go into the details of these projects. So I want to make sure that Dan has time. But if you want to talk about any of these or uh, any of those other organizations, come find me in the break or during drinks. Uh, these are just some recent projects that we're proud of. Uh, Rapid FDR is a system that we've deployed with UNICEF in Western Uganda that is tracking and registering children uh, who are lost in the movement of refugees from the, de the Democratic Republic of Congo into Uganda. Uh, its field deployment uh, happened quite recently, and the last numbers I saw were several hundred children registered and about 30 reunited with their families. Uh, this is a project where we helped an organization. These were a small social uh, enterprise that's working on rural solar electrification in India. And they had a very clever idea of how to make this affordable, which was essentially to copy the model of prepaid airtime. So instead of buying a $200 solar panel up front, you would put a down payment, get the panel, and then you'd buy your power as you go. Want a couple hours of power? It costs you a few cents. And the way it works is that you go to an agent, give them the money, they text you a code that you type into that regulator on the side, which allows the power to flow. And eventually that adds up, and you've actually bought the system. So we built the back-end systems, the billing system for that. They did the hardware. Uh, and this one I'm particularly proud of. Uh, if people are familiar with the organization Partners in Health, well, if you aren't, you should be. It's an amazing organization. And there's a great book called Mountains Beyond Mountains about the founder, Paul Farmer, who's there, who's a, one of my personal heroes, and uh, how he founded the organization. Their largest project to date is this 300-seat uh, completely modern, 300 bed, completely modern teaching hospital in Haiti. Uh, and ThoughtWorks, we were, we were honored to work with Partners in Health to create the hospital management system and built that on an open source project uh, called OpenMRS. And the gentleman in the back there uh, looking on at Paul Farmer is the doctor who was responsible for overseeing the project and building the hospital. While we were working with him, he confided in us that he was leaving Partners in Health after 15 years with the completion of this project, so we stole him. His name is Dr. David Walton, and he's now at ThoughtWorks in the Social Impact Program, heading our efforts for health care for the poor. So this is my last slide. Um, this is a summary, an inaccurate count of the hours that we spent last year in the Social Impact Program. The first column there has the asterisk. It's particularly inaccurate because people don't report their beach and volunteer time quite as well as they report their time when they're staffed on a project. So that's an estimate of the time that people volunteered 
during 2012 on social impact projects. The middle column, which is the biggest, are the staffed projects where we're full-time working on effort. Uh, and then we have some internal projects like uh, systems that we're building for online activism that we've taken on internally. That's in that column. Uh, in the bottom corner, you'll see that that's added up to over 230,000 hours that we spent in, in 2012. Did a quick calculation based on uh, stingy vacation in the states where we only get two weeks. If you take those hours and assume people work 50 uh, weeks a year, that's the equivalent of 115 full-time people working in social impact for all of 2012. So with that, I want to hand it over to Daniel to talk about some of the work he's done at CanFed. Okay, well, while the slide loads, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to do a quick check. Who's heard of CamFed apart from the brochure in front of you? Who's donated to CamFed? I know one has. I know, where's David? <laughs> That's a relief. Um, not quite as good as last minute, but still quite good. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who CamFed are, what we do, why we do what we do, and why we believe what we do is so different to how other NGOs approach development in Africa, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of the systems that we've been fortunate enough to work with Jeff and his team, Dave and Vichy, who's also around here somewhere, on developing. One of them is a, this is the first time anyone's going to hear about it. We sent out a brief newsletter to a very select few people. We've just piloted the system, and I'm quite excited by it, but I think bearing in mind what we've been talking about with regards to technology, this is old school, really, really old school. This is using a tech that a lot of people think is dead. Um, but it works in the context of developed environments. So CAMFED started in 1993 in Zimbabwe. We started off with six girls, and they were first put through school through a bursary program that our founder, Anne Cotton, set up. And she funded it through selling cakes on a market in Cambridge. Um, we are now in 2012, 2013. We've had 2.4 million beneficiaries who have been supported from us, be it through education, be it through being given financial literacy training, um, or just indirectly through attending some of our courses inside of communities. Um, the figure on the website's wrong. We still haven't quite got the integration between the live figures and the website right. We still have to manually enter it. But we're working on that as it stands. Um, we, the way that we work is slightly different. These are our three goals, our main goals. We focus on the girl involve the community, but I thought I'd talk around how we focus on the girl. We build a partnership with the girl. We don't just go into a community and we say, right, you, you need shoes. We build a partnership with her that's going to be over the whole time of her time at school. But we don't just build the partnership with her. The partnership is actually built through the community itself. So we'll go into a community, we meet the chiefs, we meet the district's education heads, we meet young women. We set up small community structures, so mother support groups, something that if you've got kids, you've probably all heard of, a support group that go after school and actually look into the benefits of the school for your children. We set them up in Africa so they can actually look at the school and make sure that the children who leave school, we're made aware of so that we can start to think, OK, we might need to support that girl. We might need to get her shoes. We might need to get her books. We might need to just pay her school fees or exam fees. I find it sad in this modern world that a girl can't go to school because she can't afford, in some cases, $20. They drop out of school for $20. Um, so so we, we focus a lot on the community. We don't send expats in that then sit within the community. It's all local resource. We build, build these structures within the community that then allow us to learn from them. So when we talk about agile development, I believe our program kind of follows that principle. We don't just go in and say, here's a product follow that. We go in and we build a community structure so we can get feedback to ensure our programs, our communications with our donors, follow that principle, and we alter our programs to match the requirements of the students. We've been working with a bursary program recently that is one girl will get everything. She'll get shoes, school fees, counter books, and everything. We've been running with it for six years now, and we've now learned from the community that that necessarily isn't the best approach. What might be the best approach is to actually look at the individual girl's needs so that we can support more girls. One girl that needs school fees doesn't necessarily need shoes. So it's allowing us to expand our program to support more and ensure the girls have the, need, the necessary tools to go to school and get an education. We do support boys. You will never get that from our website, but we do. Um, we operate a very transparent and accountable program by ensuring that everything goes back to the girl. 
everything. We make sure the girl has the shoes that fit. We don't just send all size 10s. We're actually trying to establish what size shoe the girl needs to make sure she gets the right size. And then we verify that she's got the right size. And at any time, a donor or the beneficiary can query us, can actually make contact with us and say, OK, these shoes don't fit, or I haven't received my shoes. And that's where we kind of start to think about the technology involved on how we can do that. But I want to introduce you to someone who I think is an amazing woman. This is Angie. She's one of the first six that was supported. She, her parents couldn't afford to send her to school. Anne met her, was inspired by her, arranged for her to go to school. She completed her course and excelled. At that point, I think we were supporting 1,000 girls in Zimbabwe. After that, she helped us build the first training course around financial literacy. We pulled in some experts from Cambridge, but she helped us with it, and we trained her on how to set up a business. We gave her a $50 grant, which she then used to gain independence. Suddenly, she went back into her community, and she set up her own business using this money. After a few years of running that business, she'd, she'd actually become a bit of a thought leader or a leader within her community. People went to her to ask her questions. I've got children that need help. What can I do? I've got a business I want to set up. What can I do? She then started supporting other people, understanding the concept of being philanthropic within your community. Not just, I've earned $100 this month. I'm going to keep it all to myself and my family. Understanding that apportioning that to support other girls through education is of benefit to the community. Now, the reason I picked on Angie, we've got thousands of others I could have picked on. Angie now heads up all our operations in Zimbabwe and Malawi. So indirectly, Angie, I think in the last 10 years, has helped 650,000 girls access education. One girl from a pov really badly, I get emotional about her, sorry. From such poverty is now changing the world. Now, she can't do that with pen and paper. She needs technology. And this is where the importance of the technology comes in. It's all very well us setting up these structures, but how do we communicate with them? How do we find out the information in a, in a good, time-effective way? And that's obviously mobile phones, pick up the phone, make a call, send a text message. That's a simple form of communication. As a charity, we have, uh, uh, is this going out public? We have annoying donors who are very restrictive over funds. You can spend it on 1,000 girls in that district at that school on this. It's, it's brilliant. Those girls benefit. But for us, our dream pot of money is that unrestricted one. We trust you. We know what you're doing is right. Go out there and do it. Um, but we have more of these restrictive ones than what we have unrestricted. So anyone with a lot of money, send it, please. Um, <laughs> And so our reporting to our donors is where technology comes in. And I'll move on to the mobile monitoring platform in a little while. But that's, in essence, what they want to see. They want to understand from the second a girl receives the entitlement, and we say within our financial system we've paid it against their grant, they want to see the, the triangulation effect, the girl verifying she has received that entitlement. They also want to see the change effect. That girl went to school in year one. Did she drop out in year two once their funding ended? That's how we get repeat funders showing that actually, even though you stopped funding her for year two, we found someone else to fund her, and then you come back in at year three and four because that's amazing. EOI is something that we call evidence of investment. Our way of gaining more funders is through having 74 key indicators. I was going to do something funky with a graph, but I'm embarrassed by trying to do it now. It would have been really tacky. Um, we have 74 key indicators that are our evidence of investment that show our numbers show number of partner schools. So we've got 4,000 partner schools, 2.4 million that have benefited. There are too many of them for me to name. I would have brought them all up on screen, but you would have just been, Ugh, what does that mean? And I'd have had to explain them all. I don't even know. I'm the tech guy. Um, we use technology for feeding back to beneficiaries and communities, but we're also using it in a mechanism that allows them to communicate with us. And that this communication from the beneficiary to us and the community to us is the kind of new tech that we've been working on recently. Previously, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, they still send us fax messages from the community. They still write us letters, which are, are amazing. We have literally rooms full of letters from teachers saying, I've got these 20 students that need these. Our marketing team, if we actually had a good one, would 
throw them all up on the website because I think they're so powerful to see a handwritten letter from a teacher or from a student saying, thank you. You've made a difference to my life and to my community. But we all know how important technology is, but what are the challenges face? How do you pick the right technology? I've seen a lot of talk of Android and iOS. Wow, I'm so envious. I would love to be able to give every, all two million of our beneficiaries a mobile phone that needs charging once every 24 hours. Yeah, it doesn't quite work in Africa. Yeah, eight, eight if you're a user like you. <laughs> um, so what, we have to overcome many more challenges than just the, the power issue. I sat in Ghana recently in a room of 25 women who have been for our program. I got them to hold up their mobile phones. They all had Nokias. The man that said it was the wrong horse. It's the right horse in Africa at the moment. Why have they got this Nokia mobile phone? Cost them $10. They had $100 to spend that month. If they'd have got a smartphone, they'd have had to have paid to add power, paid the bill for internet costs. Suddenly, that $100 becomes $80 spent just on communication. You can't feed a family for $20. So for us, it's looking at that technology level. What technology do they have in their hands? What can we build that gives them access to information across every platform? Um, so that kind of fills the requirements and the challenges. Funding is my biggest challenge. Having an idea and going to someone who's got restrictive funding ideas, and it's an idea and I've not built anything and no one's using it yet, and saying, I want to do that. <laughs> no way. It's kind of, so my biggest challenge at the moment is just trying to get people to see that it's a good idea, it will work. We have actually got 20 years of experience and 20 years of success behind us. Let me spend some money on building this idea out. Fortunately, we have got one, which is why I can announce something today and not just regurgitate what's in the book. Um, but then one of the biggest things is, who here has been trained on how to use Facebook? How can you build an app to work on an old dumb phone that, you don't, that doesn't need training, that doesn't need someone to be handheld through it? It's our mobile monitoring program. Most of our budget went on training people how to use the system. Not on the development of the system. Well, we got that free. But, but, and not even on the rollout. The cost of the technology was cheaper than us actually pulling everyone together to learn how to use the technology. So what did we learn from that? Quite a lot, to be honest with you. Stop trying to put an application on a phone and send it out to Africa and just expect someone's going to learn how to monitor on the spot. Try and build something that's intuitive, but also something that they're using at the moment, something that they're comfortable with as a concept. They know how to send a text message. They know how to do their balance updates. Think around that kind of mindset and also focus on the lowest common denominator. And that's where we are now. We are, I'd love to put a smartphone everywhere, and I will one day. Sorry, go on. I just want to emphasize a quick point there that uh, there's been a lot of talk about great new innovations, and I know that's what gets us excited as technologists. But the fundamental problem in the places where we work is not that there isn't technology that works. We have tons of technology that works. It's about getting that technology to everybody. The big innovation is actually about access. It's not about what we're going to have in 10 years. It's about what we have today and actually using that everywhere. It's also more of a sustainable model. If you, if you actually think from an environmental point of view, how many of you change your mobile phone once a year? I, I, from an environmental effects, I hate the, the current consumerist world that we live in where we all see a new phone and go, oh, I've got to buy it. The old mobile phone isn't necessarily being recycled correctly, and it's just a drain. But I won't bang on about my sustainability annoyances. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. So we, and you can see it in the brochure, we used to have a very hideous paper-based system that we used for our monitoring and evaluation. Around about three years ago, Dan Luton, who was in charge of our program team, kind of thought, well, this isn't going to work. At the time, we hadn't predicted our growth. Our growth since he started this process, I'm so relieved he started it. Because in the last three years, we've grown from supporting 25,000 a year to this year's going to be about 150,000 girls that we're directly putting into school that we have to go and visit three times a year and understand what their requirements are, if they've received everything. We couldn't do that without technology, not and accurately be able to report. So Jeff and his guys, in three weeks, built a system that takes Epi Surveyor, which is you have to load it on a mobile phone, but it works on any Java-based mobile phone, and allows you to put a form on there that we use for collection. You submit, answer a few simple questions, you press submit, and it goes up to the app that these guys have collected, and then it goes into our database. We use Salesforce not as a sales platform. 
we don't actually use any of the sales aspects of it. We just use it as a cloud-based platform that they give to us for free. So it works for us. It's probably not the best, but because we can do what we want with it pretty quickly. I'm not a developer, but I can build apps in it in five minutes flat. Um, now, at the point of when that was written, we were getting to there. What we've done since then is actually understand the importance of completing this circle. You can hire an enumerator to go into a community and collect information. But if they collect the information and nothing tells them anything has happened with that information, what's the point? How can you actually kind of encourage them to be wanting to do more collecting? How can you say we're going to add a new form to it? If they enter the information, they press submit, nothing. OK, did they get it? How do I know? So we've now started to build in a new mechanism that actually sends back a notification to them saying, thanks, thanks for sending it. Something simple like that. It was amazing to find that after a year of using it, we hadn't even thought of doing it until we had a little get together. I said, so what do you think of the mobile system? And we went, well, what happens? We press a button, it disappears. And, it, and that was a learning of ours. And now when I think about it, I can't believe we didn't just ask you guys to build it straight away. <laughs> There was a project about two years ago from UNICEF, we wish we'd had this conversation earlier, uh, where they were working with health workers, doing a similar thing, collecting information from the field. These people had been working for years filling out paper forms. They gave them a, an SMS-based system, and when they received a message, they got a message back that said nothing other than, thank you for sending the information. Mm -hmm. Since then, they've made it more extensive, and they say something about what they sent. But for most people in the field who'd been doing this for years, it was the first time they had ever heard anything from headquarters. Yeah. And it was an amazing change in their engagement. Well, it's, suddenly we found since we've actually, I mean, we're still only at the thank you stage. I'd love to send more back, but there's a limitation on what you can send back. But it's amazing to see that we went from a period where we just flatlined on our data collection to since we've started sending back messages, it's increasing. We're getting more and more data coming through mobile. We're, we're suddenly getting enumerators that are, are contacting us to say, I can't remember when I went to that school. I've got a thank you message. I want to go again. Can you confirm? And that's the first time in three years of running a monitoring system like this that we've had that. Uh, the technology in the background is pretty simple. Really rubbish mobile phone. Lots of clever cloud stuff, and that's it. It all goes over the internet. That's my downside with it, because there's quite often they don't have internet access. If you've ever been to Africa and you've been to a rural community, good luck with any 2G, 3G, 4G device. You'll get a GSM signal, and that's only if you're very lucky. Um, it is getting better, though, I will be on <laughs> before you jump in on that one. <laughs> um, so that's what you can read about more on there. Now I want to talk to you about an idea I had about nine months ago that was built around the idea of having this group of alumni that we have. We have all these girls that go through our program, and they are a powerful network of thought leaders within their communities. They understand the lay of the land. The un they understand the context of the issues. And they want to learn from one another. They want to understand within this Camford alumni of, OK, I'm in rural Ghana. What's the issue for a girl in rural Zambia? How do they connect? How do they, they have a very dumb, basic mobile phone and no mechanism for connecting, no mechanism for understanding. I asked some girls in Ghana recently, how do you communicate with a girl in a different district? Well, She's got a smartphone, so she uses WhatsApp to send a message to her, who then Facebooks her, who then SMSs her, and then she walks next door and asks a question. I, you can imagine how long that message, and it's Chinese whispers. God, I have no idea if the same message got there that was originally sent out. So one of my big drivers was about giving our Camford alumni, which stand at 19,000 this year, will be 45,000 next year, and it's a growing number of girls giving them a central place to come together, to collaborate, to share experiences, and learn from one another, more importantly. There's no point being an alumni if you can't learn from the experiences of others and actually see, see success stories. Understand, OK, she's a doctor now. I could, I could learn along that. What do I need to do to become a doctor or a health worker? So the new system is called SEN, Social Education Network. It's for our Camford alumni. Um, it combines a social network concept of being able to share information with one another and also bringing in some M learning aspects, but I don't want to call this an M learning platform because I'll get shot down because it is not an M learning platform. This is very much a social learning platform. It's a, I, you don't read much about the concepts of social learning, but every day, every single one of you are learning something on your social network. 
Every time you read a tweet, every time you read a Facebook update, you've learned something, unless it, you've got annoying mates like me. Uh, it needed to be completely device. I didn't need to care what device it was. It needed to be something very accessible. But more importantly, attached to this concept, it needed to be very cheap. Many of them didn't want to spend a dollar a day for internet access. Many of them wanted to access a system that cost them nothing, if possible. Um, because it's, it's, it's not sustainable for them to suddenly be given a network where they have to spend $20 a month on accessing it. It's not sustainable for us because we'd have to pay them for it. So we started looking at different technologies and I come across something which many call a dead technology. Who here has heard of USSD? Who here has developed on USSD? Woo! I'm not alone. I don't feel so crazy. <laughs> and so USSD is, it stands for Unsupplementary Service Data. It's, if you've ever had a prepaid mobile phone, you enter the star 100 hash stupid long digit, that uses USSD as a way of topping up your mobile phone. If you do a balance check, you're using USSD. It's an ISP kind of managed network that allows you to create a two-way session, very similar to the internet. You can, on some old WAP devices, you can actually access the internet on it, but I don't know if any websites support that kind of connection anymore. Um, so I kind of, I approach ThoughtWorks with almost that as my priority list. Uh, and they came for an inception. And what I found was very interesting and frustrating. And I haven't heard anyone else complain about this yet, so I'm going to complain. Um, the MVP concept, I hate it. I had a really big idea. And after inception, I wanted to throw the inception guys out the window. They tore it down to this puny little thing. They literally made me go home to my wife and say, it was a good idea until they came. Um, turns out they were right, I was wrong. So I'm willing to hold my hand up to that. Um, so I'll give you a quick couple of screenshots. My wife says it looks, sorry, pardon the French, crap. She's right, it does. But this is practical. This works on 95% of mobile phones. Standard, when you first go in, you see your latest notifications. You can update your status, which is the same as Facebook kind of concept. You can see your connections and go to an individual connection and see what they've been up to and drop them a little message. Access groups, so sharing of information about health. You can have a health group where you share information, a district group that's just dedicated to your district to share information. And then courses. So courses, we brought in the ability, because we run quite a few education systems in parallel with this, we brought in this ability for you to actually go on and take a simple five question quiz. Uh, the beauty of it is even if they cancel out of it, when they go back in, it will say, oh, you were doing this quiz and you're on question three. Do you want to resume or do you want to start again? Um, and that's just an announcement screen. That's it. It's been quite frustrating. It's been nine months of pain and hell just trying to get the ISPs in Africa to understand what USSD is, or even getting them to open a door to USSD. Um, but I think I've gone on way over my time now. So thank you very much. Final punt, camfed.org forward slash donate. I'm monitoring it to see if anyone actually does. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>